I asked my physician at the time, is there anything I can do? And he literally was like, I'm sorry, son. There's nothing you can do about this. This is something you're just gonna have to live with. My biggest struggle those two and a half years was when I laid my head down at night. Because even if I changed position, I'd get this electric shock down my leg. It was like, on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most unbearable pain, like kill me now, Yes. it was a 10. Yes. So it like literally started to play with my mind. Like I'd be in fear of getting up. You cannot do anything of great success if this is about you. My passion is not about learning and being great in this field, it's about helping people and changing that story. Like I wanna make sure that, I mean it breaks my heart. Look at you, you just changed right there. By definition, brother, you're really a world changer. Like you change people's lives. Welcome back to Max Out with Ed Milet. We've got a wonderful program for you today with a guest that I've been chasing down here for a couple months and I finally locked him in here at the house. And so this gentleman to my left hosts the number one podcast on all of iTunes in the health space called the Model Health Program. He's also a best-selling author of this book that we're gonna talk about a lot today called Sleep Smarter, which is a topic that has an awful lot to do with your wellness overall, your fitness, your mental health, your ability to perform in business is a topic that's understudied, underappreciated, and this is an expert here on all wellness, but particularly sleep as well. So I have the great Sean Stevenson with awesome. me here today. Very nice to be here. Ed. Great to have you. Like really, really excited about this. So Sean is, uh, as I told you, he's not only written this book, and he's an expert on all areas, really health and wellness. He's a nutritionist too, by trade. And he got into kind of the nutritional space. It's interesting how you ended up getting here, right? Yeah. Like uh, this theory I always tell everybody is life happens for us, not to us, right? Yeah. yeah. And you had a really interesting situation happen to you. So when you were in college, this sort of got you into the space, right? Yeah. Something happened to you in college where you ended up getting diagnosed. Am I right about yeah. this? With yeah. Tell them a little bit about what happened and how you ended up even getting into this space. Yeah, what did you yeah. get diagnosed with? So I was diagnosed with a so-called incurable spinal condition, uh, degenerative disc disease and degenerative bone disease. And so when I was 20, my physician at the time told me that I had the spine of an 80-year-old man. 80 year old. Yes, not, and not a healthy 80 year old because there's some 80 year olds out sure. there who were like killing it. Right. But I wasn't one of them, you know. Okay. My, my spine was, um, you know, I had two ruptured discs, my L4 and uh, L5S1. And so that was causing the sciatic pain. Do you know how you did it? So I thought it was some kind of trauma, you yeah. know, just from, you know, school, work, lifting weights, whatever, I didn't know. But it was because of the degeneration and instability of my spine because the tissue of my bones and my disc were so brittle, basically. So there was something technically genetic with it. That's the thing. And so that's one of the things we're gonna talk about as okay. well. You know, what we've been studying for the last decade plus is something called epigenetics. And so okay. this is looking at control above your genes. And so Good. just because you have a genetic predisposition for something doesn't mean that it has to happen. Okay. Um, if you think about a genetic program like this, like I wasn't born with the condition, right? I wasn't, I, I didn't have degenerative spinal issues when I was five. Good point. Something happened and turned it on. Turned and it so, on. Yes. Okay. And so for me, it actually started a little bit earlier than that. And this was at track practice, you know. Okay. I, for, for those who know about the NFL Combine, yeah. when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old, I ran a 4.540. Wow. And so things were looking good for me with college. And yeah. I just started having all these injuries. I actually broke my hip at track practice just running because my bones were so brittle. But nobody stopped to ask, how did this kid break his hip just from running? Yeah. And it wasn't until four years later when I got that diagnosis. You're kidding me. Yeah. And so was that, were you thinking, I may end up in a wheelchair? I may end up not being able to it was, walk? Or... That's, exactly, that's exactly it. And I was terrified, you know, to get, and here's the thing, man. Um, a lot of people hear about the placebo effect, yeah. right? Where you believe that something is going to happen when you take a medication. For example, there are studies done where folks take a placebo of a cancer pill, like a chemotherapy drug, yeah. and they proceed to have their hair fall out simply by the strength of their belief, right? Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that placebos are 33% effective in clinical trials across the board on average. That's crazy. So you have to account for the fact that the placebos are going to have an effect. Sure. And so what happened to me was the opposite of placebo. It's called a nocebo effect. Nocebo. And so this is where you get a negative injunction that something bad is going to happen. Okay. You believe it and you begin to have those symptoms. And so okay. I went from a nuisance of a pain to chronic debilitating pain hmm. after I got that diagnosis. And I asked my physician at the time, is there anything I can do mm. about this? You know, like. What, and being an athlete, I'm like, let's go. Like, right. how do we fix this? Right. And he literally was like, I'm sorry, son. There's nothing you can do about That's this. A, this is something you're just gonna have to live with. My goodness. 
Yeah. Like and a so, lifelong death sentence of exactly, some type. Exactly. And so this really sent my world spiraling, you know, and it took about two and a half years. And by the way, there's a good happy ending to this, okay. you know, but two and a half years go by and I'm reserved to literally laying on my floor most of the day. Um, wow. I was embarrassed. I wore a back brace. I went to a nightclub with a back brace on, man, you know, in college. Nobody you know? wants to date the dude with a back brace. <laughs> and I was like, the, you know, I was the cool guy, you know. Yeah. And so it just really messed with my identity. I'm sure. And um, I gained a lot of weight by being so docile, so I gained about 50 pounds. That's hard to picture now. Yeah. yeah. You know, this guy's and, abs are freakish, just so you know. And even growing now. up, like, I was the, the skinny kid in my family. Mm. And so, but I had, we all, there's that fat gene, and it got turned on. The fat gene got turned on, yeah. too. Yeah, and so, you know, gaining all this weight definitely slipped into some depression, yeah. you know. And it wasn't until, and this is really important, but a lot of people miss this, and I know you know how powerful this is. It wasn't until I really hit rock bottom, and I realized, like, I have a choice to make. I'm just, literally, I don't care about living anymore. Wow. I wasn't, like thinking about taking my life, but I just didn't care. Yeah. Like I just got to that point, mm. or I'm gonna do something about it. And I decided to get well, you know? And mm. most people never do that. It's mm. more like wishful thinking. We'll see what happens. I'll give mm. this a shot. I mm. hope this works. Mm. I'll give this a try. Mm. I decided no matter what, I'm going to get well. Mm. And so, and it wasn't like, you know, a, uniform, a unicorn came out yeah. and clouds parted. Like it wasn't that kind of a moment, but I felt this renewed energy, like I'm gonna figure this out. Mm. And I'd actually gone to school initially pre-med when I first went to college, <laughs> but I hate—I actually hated science. <laughs> and so I, I dropped out of that, and it's because of a movie, Boomerang, with Eddie Murphy, I don't yes, know if you remember that. of course. I got into marketing, and so like I was like, this is what I'll do, but <laughs> fate had other plans for me, brought me back mm. to science. And so when I was in college, we were taught pharmacology, right? Yes. If there's a problem, you take a pill. Like we were taught a lot about sickness. Mm -hmm. We weren't taught about health. Right? So, and so I decided to learn everything that I could about health and I became just obsessed. obsessed. Yeah. And long story short, six weeks later after making that decision, I lost 28 pounds. The pain I've been experiencing for two and a half years was gone. Nine months later, I went and got a scan done of my spine. I regenerated my tissue. My two ruptured discs had retracted on their own. Oh my gosh. And I, I got my life back. Not back, it was better than it had ever been. It was been. better than prior. Yeah. That's amazing because there's so many people I think that are watching this that they get to that point too where they just don't care. Yeah. You're at that yeah. point where you just don't care. And learned I, helplessness. Learned helplessness, yeah. exactly right. And that, the power, like really, this is an oversaid thing in sort of the personal development world, but like the power of making an actual real decision. Yeah. I exactly. mean a real one, yeah. which is what you did, literally altered your life. Done. And it was really interesting because if you look back in hindsight, always life happens for us, not to us. It's interesting because your whole wellness background and nutrition background, and obviously this, this debilitating diagnosis prepares you for being the number one guy in this space now, right? This is the number one guy in the nutritional health wellness space in the entire internet, in the entire world, number one guy, right? But it's also interesting that the marketing thing helps you too, because yeah, you got a program, you got a market, exactly. right? So if you exactly. didn't take the marketing detour, yeah. maybe the podcast isn't as big, maybe you haven't helped as many people as you've yeah. helped. I like to say life qualifies you, mm. right? Uh, life like doesn't that. call the qualified, life qualifies the called. And so oh, wow. it wasn't my intention to do this work, but life was really qualifying me because not only once I had this experience of something so-called incurable, mm. no, no longer being a part of my life, when I would hear other people say, you know, cancers, diabetes, mm. uh, heart disease, that these things were incurable, I could take a firm stand in knowing like whatever created you, to think that something's outside the power of actually being able to, to heal you from whatever this is, is just stupid to think mm. that that something is incurable. I want to tell everybody something about this because this man's obsessed with health. He's obsessed, he's also gifted because he's got this background and he's got a brain to be able to digest this stuff and process it, but this topic is fascinating to me, where we're going now. This book right here, it's called Sleep Smarter, and I want to tell you one thing about this. This book isn't 20 pages, it's a comfortable read. I read it in a day. I read the entire book in a day, and the reason was I could not stop reading it because I'm fascinated with rest and recovery too. So yeah. like, we're both fit guys, we're both not 15 years old anymore either, yeah, right? Exactly, and yeah. it's interesting because people will ask me often, how often do you train? And I train my legs five days a week, and I always think when someone tells me that, like, do you not understand the recovery process? Do you not understand resting? Yeah. So I train hard when I train, but I think one of the reasons I'm relatively fit is that I rest and recover with yeah. my muscles too. Yeah. I didn't think about it though through the prism of sleep. And so there's a lot of information out there about nutrition. You can pick a diet, you can pick a workout. 
there's not a lot of information about sleep and how important it is to your health, your wellness, your productivity, clarity of thinking, longevity, energy, all of it. And so, and I, I wanna talk now about some specifics. Yes. So first things first, why does sleep matter? Like what's the big deal about sleeping? Right? And we talked about it being one of the three pillars of the change for yes, you. Yes. But in general, for someone who's out there that thinks, I don't have a degenerative condition. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I work hard, I wanna kill it, I wanna work. And, and I know that not more sleep is necessarily better than less sleep, it's how you sleep, I think, but tell me why does sleep matter? Let them first know, understand that principle. Let's talk about three specific categories. Number one, okay. the very visceral connection of your body composition. Okay. University of Chicago did a study recently, blew my mind. I yeah. hope you're ready to have your mind blown. This okay. is crazy. Okay. So they took exercise, I'm sorry, they took dieters. Yes. Conventional calorie restricted diet, what I was taught in a university setting to have patients do, and they monitored their results. Now. They tracked everything and they allowed them in this phase of the study to get eight and a half hours of sleep. Okay. Another phase of the study, they take the same exact people, same exact diet, they're not exercising more, they're not cutting any more calories, but they sleep deprive them. They right? deprive them of sleep. Yes, so now they take away three hours of sleep, they're getting five and a half hours. At the end of the study, they compiled all the data and they found that when individuals were well rested, they lost 55% more body fat wow. simply by getting more sleep. Wow. Right? Now, I'm telling you, we mentioned this yeah. when we were talking, but my book is called Sleep Smarter, Not Sleep More. Not Sleep right? More, right. It's really, the longer people sleep, they're gonna have a tendency to hit the sleep cycles accurately. You don't need to do that. Okay. There are people who are getting six hours of sleep that are crushing it, crushing people that are getting nine hours. Okay. But this is just an example of like how much sleep matters. Okay. The question is, it should be, right. how is that possible? Correct, right? yep. So here's why. Number one, I mentioned human growth hormone. Yes. This is a very anabolic, muscle sparing, mm -hmm. energizing hormone. Mm -hmm. So human, kids have a tremendous amount of They issues. OD on it, right. This is why they're running around crazy, have all this energy. Right. And so when we get around 18 to 20, we have a pretty noticeable drop, you know, in the clinical research mm -hmm. in HGH. My argument is not because you're 18, it's because we stop <laughs> abiding by a sleep schedule, right? Mm. We're out of the house, mm. right? You can't tell me what to do anymore. Mm. And so we start to really mess with our sleep so cycles. So it's behavioral, not necessarily age. Yes. Okay. Now, age is a factor, but it's not, in my opinion, the, the biggest factor. factor. Okay. You know, it should take some more time before that noticeable decline happens. Because it falls off a cliff at that age, right? Which it shouldn't. It should be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. There's a pretty sharp decline. Now, okay. here's another thing, and this should be pretty mind-blowing for folks as well. <laughs> you know about, of course, everybody knows about melatonin now. Yes for in regards to sleep. Yes. It's also a really powerful fat burning hormone. Yes, okay. right? So, Journal of Pineal Research. Now, this is really fascinating. Melatonin, it increases your body's mobilization of something called brown adipose tissue. What's it called? Brown adipose tissue. Okay. Or you can call it BAT for okay. short, all right? So this is brown fat, Okay. All right? Brown fat operates much like muscle in that it burns fat. So it's a type of fat that burns fat. So when okay. we think about we want to burn fat, lose weight, what we're trying to get rid of is white adipose tissue. You know, okay. that's the kind of gooey stuff okay. that people are trying to target. Brown adipose tissue, naturally, we don't carry that much on our frame. There's some by your sternum, a little bit on your back, your shoulders, but we don't really carry that much. It's activated via cold. That's one of the things. That's why cold thermogenesis is such a big thing. I'm big on it. And also melatonin, okay. right? This sleep hormone. And if you're not getting a dark cycle, you're not producing melatonin adequately. Okay. And so this is another reason why getting more optimized sleep, folks were losing more body fat. Okay. And by the way, in the study, I said they lost 55% more fat, not weight. Yeah, fat. That's You're the key. About body fat. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. Let's talk about melatonin. Let's stay on that for a okay. second. Should you be getting more sunlight in order to get melatonin? Does that affect your in, um, introduction of melatonin into your body, getting sunlight, or are they not related? That's a powerful question. Okay. Most people don't think about this, but this is why I said, a great night of sleep starts the moment you wake up in the morning. Okay. Sunlight starts the process. It does. Okay. So it was uh, Innovations in Clinical Neuroscience did a study, and they found that folks who were getting more uh, optimal sunlight during the day, number one, they had reduced cortisol levels in the evening. And cortisol is like the joker to melatonin's Batman, all okay. right? So if cortisol is elevated, melatonin is suppressed. Got it. And vice versa. Okay. So that's number one. So they found that cortisol levels were lower at night. Tell people what cortisol will do to you if oh, it's elevated. Man. This is, is another mean? reason that that study was so profound is because of the impact of cortisol when okay. you're getting more sleep. Cortisol has this really interesting ability to break down your valuable muscle tissue and turn it into energy, turn it into glucose. So you can work so hard to build this muscle and lose it because you're not getting adequate sleep, right? Okay. And so 
It's a process called gluconeogenesis. Okay. And it's a stress response because when you're in, you know, cortisol is kind of glorified stress hormone. Yep. It's not a bad guy. Mm -hmm. It's just when it's produced in the wrong amounts and at the wrong times. Okay. All right. So gluconeogenesis, that's sh glucose creation. Okay. Break down your muscle tissue and muscle is your body's fat burning machinery. Yes. That's the thing. This is why people who carry more muscle in their frame naturally just burn more energy. They burn more calories. Okay. It's such a valuable commodity that you will lose or have to continuously work harder to maintain if you're not getting adequate sleep. And that's really the key. So cortisol. Now, sunlight does another really interesting thing. So it increases your body's production of serotonin. Okay. And everybody's probably heard of serotonin now. It's kind of this feel-good neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is a precursor or opening act for melatonin. Okay. So it's converted in your body into melatonin. So if you produce adequate serotonin, you're gonna be doing pretty good in that melatonin department. Okay, so that's a big reason why we wanna control our sleep. Now let's get into the sleep. Actually, I don't wanna to get to the sleep environment. I wanna go through one more thing. There is an effect that I've never thought of when it comes to wellness and even sleep and the melatonin factor, all that into one, which is involves your gut. Yeah. So can oh, you man. just, and by the way, what I don't wanna do, <laughs> there's so much in this book there's 21 essential strategies in here. We're gonna to touch on like three. You yeah. gotta read the book to get the rest of them, right? But involving that, talk a little bit about gut health and how that affects all of this as well. I just want people, because for me, it seems to me lately, the more I'm reading about all wellness, all health, more and more of it seems to start to get tied to the gut. Yeah. More and more things seem to be messed up in that area and most people yeah. that cause dis-ease in their body, yeah. so to speak. So yeah. can you speak to that just for a oh, second? Oh man, it's an absolute epidemic, you know? Okay. Uh, towards the end of my clinical practice, you know, we've seen so many cases of Crohn's and colitis and, yes. you know, IBS. And, um, you know, it's really somewhere that I shifted my focus in my practice. Today, we're not going to be able to break down literally what's going on with the microbiome and how to fix that. Yeah. But we're going to relate this to sleep. Okay. And so your gut is actually, when we talked earlier about melatonin, right? A lot of people, I know I was shocked to find this out. I had no, when I was taught this in school, you produce melatonin from your pineal gland, end of story. Okay. But it's just not true, okay. right? Which is in your brain. Yes. You have 400 times more melatonin in your gut than you have in your brain, mm. right? And, and uh, they did a study and they actually were doing pinealectomies, so taking the pineal gland out and the levels of melatonin still remain stable. Okay. Okay, so there's something missing in our communication yeah. about melatonin. So sleep in many ways starts in your gut. It does. Right? And so there are interchromaffin cells that are okay. in the gut that are producing kind of sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters. And so here's another way that this matters. Um, this was um, a really interesting kind of curveball that mm -hmm. I saw where we've got serotonin, what I talked about earlier, which yep. is the precursor to melatonin. So I don't want to lose people here. Yeah, I'm with you. So serotonin, the vast majority of your body's serotonin over 80 plus percent is located in your gut In as your well, gut as well. Right? So we've got this dance happening okay. in your gut. And it's related, and this was our research coming from uh, UC Berkeley and also Caltech specifically, okay. looking at how certain bacteria in your gut communicate with cells yes. that produce these sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters. Yes. So to put a bow on this, yep. we have to take care of our gut microbiome, okay. right? The bacteria, which some people get a little weirded out by that. Yep. I know I did. Right. You have more back. You have upwards of ten times more bacteria cells than you have ed cells. Okay. Right? Most of them are in, are in your gut. Okay. And it's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a symbiotic relationship. Okay. But for many of us, it's become like a parasitic situation okay. where we have lower level funguses, bacteria, opportunistic bacteria running our ship, okay. and they're not producing those adequate hormones and neurotransmitters to make sure we get great sleep. So I want to leave people with this real, since we're on this topic, three quick strategies. Yeah, how do you do it? And so right. I call these good sleep nutrients, right? Okay. And so these are specific things you consume that impact your sleep. So one of them, and this was public, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Public Library of Science, right? Okay. The PL, PLOS journal. Anything I say, people can triple check me, yep. by the way. Yep. And so what they found was vitamin C, Funny enough, we know about this for the immune system. Folks who were deficient in vitamin C had a tendency towards being the people who had more interrupted sleep. So they woke up more frequently okay. simply by a nutrient deficiency. Okay. All right? So also magnesium, which is responsible for over 300 biochemical processes in the body. It's a huge component of sleep. Okay. And so when magnesium is deficient, which is the number one mineral deficiency in our country today, okay. you're gonna have interrupted sleep or lower quality sleep. And lastly, as far as taking care of the microbiome, 
we just have to really this is more about avoiding avoid okay. the things that kill your gut bacteria so processed okay. sugar for the most part i'm not saying you can't have pancake of course right? right at some point but that needs to be in the exception not the rule okay because you're feeding the opportunistic bacteria okay um chlorine you need to be mindful of that okay right? what and has chlorine in it our water okay you know, if it's tap water okay right? chlorinated water it's used as it, and by the way i would rather have chlorine in the water than drinking you know recycled sewage right sure and so a lot of people don't realize like 40 million households across the u.s were tested and they found not significant amounts but trace amounts but enough to freak you out of chemotherapy drugs of antidepressants of um heart medications the question is why would this be in our drinking water yeah right, right? this is literally coming through 40 million americans tap water and it's because people are right the, yeah, cycle. the cycle people are pissing in the yeah. water and it's eventually kind of making its way oh back to your house. Gosh. So I want chlorine in the water right. if we're doing the practice that we're doing now, which I think it could be improved. But bottom line, chlorine is antibiotic. Okay. All right. It kills stuff. Yeah. So you need some in there. Your microbiome, guess what? Yep. You know, these are bacteria. So, so that, those, and I'm not, I'm not saying you need some. I okay. think that there's a better way we can go about treating our water. But if you had to decide, yeah. you know, take the chlorine. Take the water, chlorine. But, yeah. So those of you that are listening, you're more simple. You got these onins right that are controlled in your gut and one of the things if you're having a hard time sleeping is you need to check your gut health and you need to read the chapter in his book on gut health because it is directly related to your serotonin and your melatonin in your body and helping you sleep at an optimal level let's continue to talk a little bit more about sleep and so a couple tips you have for sleep that i love is being cool yeah so what does that mean like i sleep with a thing called a chili pad i actually have in my bed yeah. are you recommend those or yeah, those it's okay in the to book do? it's, okay. in, it's okay. in the resources in the way I, in the I know it is so okay, <laughs> i just want to make sure they know this but and yeah. i'm not pumping that or not but how important is it to be like let's talk about how do i sleep better so i get yeah. my gut health together yeah. i get it starts when i wake up in the morning taking in more sunlight preparing through my day but give me a few things like i know you talk in the book about um sleeping cool yeah. and also being <laughs> cognizant of your caffeine intake and when you take it yeah. too right so talk about those two things real quick oh, absolutely so Good. as far as being in a, a being cool this is in relationship to something our bodies have a process called thermoregulation okay right? thermoregulation when i was in school again this is the like the miseducation of sean stevenson right yeah. so in school we're taught you know optimal human body temperature is 98.6 degrees right yes but your body temperature changes a lot through the day like okay. if i was to track your your metrics you know yeah. t take your temperature test your blood sugar after a great workout like every like we can get you diagnosed with something and okay. all you did was just did do it a, a okay. great training session right okay so your body temperature changes a lot and during the evening there's a natural drop in your core body temperature to facilitate sleep there's okay. a correlation of release of mm. certain neurotransmitters and hormones related to that drop mm. right so if your environment is too warm your body has to work harder to try to cool itself and it can basically throw a monkey wrench in that process. Okay, so and cool so, down. So how do you get cool? Use a chili pad or not have too many blankets over you? Is that? Yeah, you know, the basic thing is, you know, we live in an environment today where we're very fortunate, where we can literally, we have a thermostat, thermostat right? Yeah. And so researchers conclude that it's approximately right between 62 and 68 degrees okay. is optimal for sleep. Okay. And so, I, I got to tell you, along those lines, at least for me, I think I did, I think I t took caffeine in too late at night. The other thing for me is when I bought this chili pad, I could not get over how much deeper and better rested I felt that when I woke up, when I was cooler, when I slept. I couldn't, that one thing alone yes. was a, and almost everybody I know who uses one or at least is cognizant of temperature in the room yeah. says that's a huge thing when it comes to rest It can sleep. be that one thing okay. that's game changing. So I'm gonna back this up by studies, right? Okay. So there was a really cool study that was done on insomniacs, all right? So these are people with chronic sleep issues. Yeah. And what they did was they put them in these thermo suits to drop their skin surface temperature just one degree. Okay. At the end of the study, they compiled the data and these folks were falling asleep and staying asleep just about as long as folks who did not have insomnia. That's awesome. So you've got Ambien? Yeah. Or you can cool, cool, yourself cool your down. ass off, okay. right? And so- what, what about caffeine? Talk about caffeine Caffeine, real quick. wow, yeah. So full disclosure, I love caffeine. Me too. Right? I'm a fan. <laughs> Me too. But it's how we use it in our culture. And it's okay. been used for thousands of years. Like okay. it has a really interesting resonance with the human body. And so caffeine, so let me just first of all start with the study. So they took individuals in the study to find out how caffeine specifically affects sleep. They gave them caffeine literally right before bed, three hours before bed, or six hours before bed, okay. and tracked the results. Even six hours before bed was enough to, to cause some serious issues with their sleep cycles, to the degree that folks uh, subjectively 
they thought that they slept for eight hours, but they okay. lost one full hour of sleep mm. by having caffeine six hours before bed. Okay. Okay. And okay. so what's going on there? Caffeine has a half-life, it's called a half-life of about eight hours on average. All right. So this means after eight hours, about a, it, you say if you have a 200 milligram cup of coffee, mm -hmm. 100 mill milligrams, half, after eight hours is still active in your system. Okay. And that can keep your nervous system pretty lit up for a lot of people. Okay. So, and it depends on your metabolism for it. Sure. Everybody's kind of unique. But in general, you know, I recommend if you're gonna have caffeine, have it early in the day, okay. early afternoon, especially in the morning. Okay. Give your body time to metabolize it, process it. Okay. And some, for some folks, that might be the thing that they need to avoid completely because they might not have an efficient metabolism. Okay, it. let's talk about two more things when it comes to sleep. This is wonderful, by the way, because even for me, like my caffeine intake is too late in the day. It's too late in the day, it's affecting my sleep. I think I'm asleep and I'm not, right? I'm not getting deep sleep. That's the thing, yeah. Let's talk about um, color in the room. So how important is it for it to be dark to help you get into deep sleep compared to light in the room? Is there an impact of those two things? Yes. Okay. To produce melatonin, you need two requirements. Okay. One of them is darkness. Okay. All right. The other thing is uh, a cycle. Like it, it has to have a consistent cycle. Okay. So, so some folks that do night work, for example, but they can get their room totally dark yep. and they have a consistent night ritual where they're creating their own nighttime, yes. they can produce melatonin, but okay. they need the darkness. Okay. And so just to back that up, Cornell University, this study it knocked, knocked my socks off. But I geek out on this stuff, so. It's not geeked out, it's awesome. It's <laughs> Cornell, validation, people hear stuff, especially in the world, they're like, prove it. You yeah. prove it every time you make a point. So they took, uh, they took their test subject, they put him in an otherwise dark room, and they took a light the size of a quarter, okay. fiber optic cable, and put it behind their knee. Okay. That small light was enough to disrupt their sleep cycle, mm. all right? But this, we need to take a step back here, okay. because when people keep hearing me talk about sleep cycle yes. and sleep, smarter not sleeping more yep. it's really about optimizing those sleep cycles so what does that mean sleep cycles are determined by changes in your brain waves okay okay and so there and there's more to this than this but just to simplify we've got gamma waves which is sometimes happens during waking state most of us are hanging out in beta then we move to alpha then we move to theta and then delta is deep anabolic non-rem sleep Okay. We need to efficiently cycle through these okay. over and over through the night. All right. Most of those sleep cycles are about 75 to 120 minutes, depending on the person. Okay. And so what I recommend for people is a minimum of four complete sleep cycles, which is around six hours. Okay, good, that's right. what I get. All right, but making sure that we're optimizing okay. that, Okay. All right. And so how do we do this? That's all of these small things. It, yes. Being cool, yep. darkness. Okay. If you're, you know, if you're exposed to light in the evening, for example, it can throw specifically throw off your sleep cycle. Okay. Alcohol too close to bed can be an issue for some people. Do you believe in um, a couple things? By the way, this is so good for me. I hope you're, if you're driving in this. You're going. I wish I were writing all this down. You're going to go replay this again. But I'm just curious. I haven't asked you this. What do you think about the blue light stuff? So uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, this this is this is powerful. I'm just curious your opinion yeah. about it. What about blue light? So yeah. tell them what that is real quick. Then we'll finish with a fun thing on sleep. But tell them what blue light means Absolutely. and how you feel about it. I don't know yeah. how you feel about it. You so. know, I've, I've been talking about this for, again, about five years. Okay. You know? So a, a lot of folks have heard about this by yeah. now, you know. But a lot haven't, though. Yeah. Most haven't that are listening to this. Again, I look to the research instead mm -hmm. of just like, you know, this yeah. might be a problem. But yeah. so Harvard researchers confirm that blue light exposure from our favorite devices, you know, our smartphones, mm -hmm. television, laptops, does in fact elevate your cortisol at night. Okay. Which they tested during the day, it doesn't impact you during the day. It's okay. because your body's expecting a nighttime cycle. Got right? it. So it elevates cortisol and suppresses melatonin, mm -hmm. okay? And so according to their numbers, every hour you're on your device at night mm. without some kind of a protection or strategy, it suppresses melatonin for 30 minutes. Wow. And so you can go to sleep because you're exhausted, but your melatonin can still be suppressed. Got and it. you're not gonna efficiently go through those sleep cycles that we talked about. So what do we do? Get off our phone or is there something else that we should do? There's a couple of things. So let's be real. Like yeah. tech's not slowing down. Yes. I'm not a Luddite. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I love my I love my iPhone. Me you know? too. Yeah. Um this is huge. There right are here, some and the thing is I don't, from my perspective, the research is not conclusive how effective it is. Okay. But I'm just gonna throw this out there. Sure. Because for a lot of folks, anecdotally, mm -hmm. they say it does help a lot, okay. which is using some kind of blue light suppressive device. So yes. on all of their devices for Apple, the iPads, yes. uh, iPhones, they have uh, a tool called Night Shift, yes. which pulls out the most troublesome spectrum of light, the blue light, yes. this kind of white light, strong light, and kind of cools your screen off. Yes. And so you could just, 
set that on, okay. set it and forget it, okay. you know? And then for your laptops, desktops, there's a, a tool called Flux, it's totally free. You just go to Dr. Google, type F dot L-U-X, and I've been using it for about five years. What a, what a great tip, and I do want to say this to you, both those devices work, and the other thing is really, trying to get off that device within some window before your sleep, not just for the melatonin factor, for the deep sleep factor, but also um, for quieting of the mind factor. Yes. If the last things you're doing before you go to sleep are worrisome, stressful, task-related things, it's just much harder to get to sleep when you're doing that. So I try to give myself some runway yes. before I sleep, exactly. and I know that you do too. Here's the good news. This is adult time, by the way, the next uh, 90 seconds. But Wait, before we get yeah, to that, yeah. since we're talking about the mind, I, yep. I gotta throw this in there give for there. people because there are a lot of people listening to your show yep. who wanna be optimized in their performance, yes. in their focus, yes. in their energy, and so, and I'm a, I'm a nutritionist. I was yeah. like, food is everything, but yeah. it's just not. Your sleep matters more yes. than your nutrition and your exercise combined if you're not doing it properly. Yeah. So I want to share this study. So this is published in The Lancet, and they took physicians, and they had them to complete a task. Okay. All right? Sleep deprived them, had them come back and do the same thing. Here's what happened. They made 20% more mistakes doing the same exact thing. Okay and it took them 14% longer to do the same exact thing when they're sleep deprived. And this is not uncommon in the world of physicians, and it's not uncommon in our world, mm. right? So there's a big difference between doing work and being effective. Sure. And we're taking away so much of our effectiveness because we're sleep deprived. UC Berkeley did brain imaging scans, actually looking at what happens in our brain when we're sleep deprived. Just a short sleep debt of 24 hours, right? And so the first thing they saw was a cooling in the activity in the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of your brain responsible for decision making, social control, the distinguishing between right and wrong. That part of the brain literally starts to turn off, right? Mm -hmm. And correlated with an activation in your amygdala, right? This okay. is the more primitive part of your brain that's responsible basically for your fight or flight system survival. and it's concerned about survival of self, yes. right? Yes. This is when you tend to say something you don't really yes. need to say. <laughs> you'll make decisions, you'll hook up with the person you weren't, yes. you know, like a lot yes. of decisions happen with yes. your food choices, okay. right? when you're sleep deprived, when you're tired. True. Nobody, tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. I've never heard one person who's up two o'clock in the morning binge watching <laughs> on, you know, the Game of Thrones and they're some like, broiled chicken you know what, yeah, can you throw me some broccoli, <laughs> right? <laughs> I've just got it to crave. This is when you go get the cookies you're and the so ice right. cream, you know, like yeah, it never happens, food. you know, yeah. so. Thank you yeah. for sharing that, by the way, and that's an absolute fact. I, <laughs> you're so right about that. By the way, that's just 24 hours of deprivation too, that's right? It, that's yeah. not weeks or months of it like some of us are going through. And so we we're going to talk about this adult time. Here's the good news. Before you go to sleep at night, there is one thing you can do to help you sleep deep that everybody would enjoy doing. This is for you adults out there. So yeah. tell them what that one thing is that can help <laughs> you sleep. So listen, you know, there's this term in culture, right? In the movies, right? Somebody's sleeping together. Yes. Right. I was like, together. when I was a kid, I hear that. I'm like, but you're not sleeping. sleeping. Right? <laughs> well, come to find out your sex life has a huge impact on your sleep life yeah. and vice versa. Your mm. sleep has a huge impact on your sex. Okay. And so when you have an orgasm, you release a cocktail of chemicals mm -hmm. that all improve sleep, all right? Mm -hmm. So oxytocin, for example. Mm -hmm. Oxytocin has a direct correlation to uh, reducing cortisol, all right? So we okay. talked about how cortisol can be a problem with your sleep. Oxytocin knocks that right out. Okay. Prolactin is another really interesting one. So there was a study I cited in Sleep Smarter, and this was done on laboratory animals. And so they injected them with pro, uh, prolactin, and they become okay. sleepy immediately, Okay. All right? So when you have an orgasm, you produce prolactin. Now here's a little fun fact. When ma males tested, when they have an orgasm by themselves yep. versus having an orgasm with their partner, you, pr you release four times more prolactin with a partner, with a partner. Good than news. you do by yourself. This is yeah. why I guess you know, somebody masturbates and they're like, yeah. go eat a bowl of cereal and watch <laughs> cartoons or whatever. <laughs> Versus, you know, you're with your partner and they're like, you know, you're, you're sleepy all the time, you're you know, sleepy. when you go, when you have an orgasm. So we've got that. We've got uh, norepinephrine on and on. Norepinephrine is a player in optimizing that sleep cycle we talked about. It's related okay. to REM sleep, right? Okay. REM sleep is where you get your dream on. But mm -hmm. also REM sleep is responsible for something called memory processing. Okay. This is where your experiences, even from today, what people are learning about, it gets converted to your short-term memory. Okay. And that's one of the places that really gets hit hard with sleep deprivation and also, you know, drinking too close to bed. By the way, I just got, I got to throw this in here. Mm -hmm. So alcohol does in fact help you fall asleep faster. Period, end of story, bar none. The small issue is that it creates something called a REM rebound effect. Mm -hmm. So this hap 
since you're processing memories while you're sleeping, this is why you can have that experience. I know this will never happen to you. <laughs> yeah. Where you wake up, you don't really remember what you did. Don't even right? yeah. yeah. When you when you might drink a little bit too yeah. much, right? And this never. is because your REM sleep is disrupted. And so and also this is why we have this concept of a hangover. It's not because you didn't sleep, it's because uh-huh. your REM sleep was so disrupted, your sleep cycle period, okay. right? And so what I recommend people to do is not to not drink, it's just like employ some simple strategies. Make sure you're getting hydrated, yes. right? Nature's solution to pollution is dilution, right? Okay. So drinking some water to help dilute, support your liver. Maybe have a little bit of a curfew, you know, give yourself maybe you know an hour or two before yep. you go to bed, you know, when you finish drinking, you know, just small things. There's several things you could do to not turn your life upside down, but still. And, and the big thing is, the big thing is have a big O before you go to bed at night. And even better is do that with somebody else and you get four times the hit, right? There you go. I love that. That's like, <laughs> that's so, so good. Such good news for so many of you out there. I give you another reason to have that conversation with your partner. I know you have a headache, but we want to sleep deep tonight. So Get off your phone 30 minutes. Exactly. Hopefully, you All know. All this stuff is related. Yeah. The wine does help, but I get your point about the wine. So, okay, I'm with you on that. So, this has been awesome. So, what I want you to do, number one, is I want you to get sleep smarter. I want you to get the book. We've talked about this enough times. Here's how popular this thing is. On Audible, this is two years later. This book is still the number two seller on all of Audible last month. So this is that's a credit to you. It's such a powerful topic. Mind blowing. And you're such an expert on this, right? I want to finish up though with winning. So obviously, this is such a huge thing because sleep is tied to all of it. But now I want to kind of finish with you, right? Because you're this expert. You're obviously incredibly articulate. You're doing something, you're chasing in your life your real passion. Like you're obsessed with wellness. You're obsessed with health. So I think that's one of the reasons you're just so incredibly successful, right? But there's more to it than that. So if you were talking to this audience, this is someone who's built this incredible practice. It's not by mistake you're the number one person in this space, right? Like that's that's not number 19, which would still be pretty damn impressive, right? But number one in this space. So you become the best in the world at something. like. How have you done that? Like, talk to someone about becoming elite, becoming an elite performer, getting to the top of something. Is it just that you've chased your passion or are there other things in there, the way you think, the way you process information, your identity? Like, yeah. what would you tell someone, listen, this has been the key, some of the keys to you becoming you? Wow, that's, that's a powerful question. Yeah. You know, the first thing that's jumping to mind is, you know, when we go to school, we're taught what to learn, right? We're not taught how to learn. And so I'm a big advocate and what I've done is finding a way to learn faster, right? Mm -hmm. Becoming a great, somebody who is able to assimilate information. And here's what, I'll just tell you how I do it. I haven't really shared this before. My next question, how do you do it? So whenever I'm reading a study, whenever I'm reading a book, I'm thinking about how can I teach this, right? As I'm consuming the information, because it's not about me. Wow, you know that I do that too, keep going. But I do that too, I didn't know I did it, but I do. You cannot do anything of great, success if this is about you Mm. and so my passion is not about learning and being great in this field it's about helping people Mm. and changing that story like i want to make sure that i mean it breaks my look at you you just changed right there just changed you you're good keep going (sighs) (laughs) when i think about these kids you know, who are in cancer treatment centers right now, you know? Mm. And how things can be better. And our system is broken, you know? Mm. Our, we've got some amazing physicians, and many of them are my friends, you know? Yeah. Um, and now they're shifting more to integrative medicine, functional medicine, because the way that we've taught historically, you know, in conventional medicine in the last few decades, we're terrible at chronic illness. Everything mm. has gone up. How? Mm if we're so smart and good at what we do, you know? And the the, the truth is, if you take a really smart person, which these are the best of the best, and you teach them the wrong thing, they become world-class at doing the wrong thing. Mm. And so that's what really drives me, man, is- I could see it all over your face. Actually, it's coming down your face, yeah. Is doing whatever we can do to help to facilitate the next generation. And Mm. I know that so many of our, our problems in society, you know, with violence, with just this big, dichotomy that we're experiencing right now has to do with people don't do well because they don't feel well and so instead of me getting out and protesting that's not my that's not my path my path is how can i get people healthier so we can have great conversations so we can meet each other Mm -hmm. and have more compassion it's very difficult to have compassion when you're sleep deprived Mm -hmm. it's very difficult to have compassion when you're when you're dying inside because your body's experiencing you know chronic illness you know 
all of those things drive me to be the best possible. Yeah. You know? And so I was not expecting. Yeah. I was not expecting to, to say that. But I'm glad that you got. You, so I'm glad you showed that because it's the real you. And I tell you, the first time we talked, you inspired me. Look at you. You're still thinking about it, right? The first time we talked, brother, you inspired me. Like I knew right when we talked, like that we're kindred spirits. And um, I want to thank you for today. But really not for today. I want to thank you for the last 10 years of your life, the work you've done, and what you're going to do the next 10 years. You're, by definition, brother, you're really a world changer. Like, you change people's lives. Like, Thanks. think about that. This guy starts out, he had a real interesting upbringing that we talked about a little bit, where he was raised in a pretty good environment, then a really bad environment. Then he gets this degenerative disease. And you turn this life-altering, for some people, would be life-ruinous yeah. diagnosis into not only you turning around your own life, but then you've inspired and helped millions of other people get well and change their own lives. Like, and I just want, I hope that Sean gives you hope and gives you inspiration that if you chase your passion in life, if you learn to learn faster, if you think about learning things in order to give to others, all these great keys he's given you, and you get that kind of emotion on your face about what you do in your life and the difference you make, you can be a world changer just like this man right here to my left. And so I don't want their relationship with you to end today because I want folks to get well and healthy. And I know science changes, information changes, and you're gonna, if you're following him, you'll be on the cutting edge of wellness and health and energy for the next decade if you follow Sean. And so they can find you at your podcast. Yep, it's called Tell, the Model Health Show. The Model Health Show. And then yep. on social media, how do they find you? Are you under Sean Stevenson? Yeah. Is there any Just underscores or anything like that? type me in, you should find me, but I'm at Sean Model, S-H-A-W-N Model. Sean Model on yeah, social media. Yeah. I mean, really thank you for today. Like I, I told you, I read this book in, in one one full sitting without awesome. putting it down. And then like today, we could have gone three more hours because everything you say, you back up with studies, you back up with facts, but it comes from this heart, man. It comes from this place of passion. So God bless you, brother. Thank you, All man. of you that are listening, thank you so much. Appreciate really it. enjoyed thank it. You. Those of you that are listening, I always ask you, I bring you the best people in the world at what they do. I just brought you the greatest in the world when it comes to health and wellness, and particularly in sleep in this endeavor. Go get his book, and in my case, if you're watching this on YouTube, make a like, give it a comment, and if it's on an audio podcast, please, anywhere you are, give it a review. It'll help it move up the rankings. I sure would appreciate it. God bless you, and max out, everybody.